So I'm going to be talking to you um, about Watson. Uh, I've been doing this for about a, about a year and a half, ever since Watson uh, rose to fame uh, playing Jeopardy. When we first started talking about Watson, it was talking about what is Watson. Watson, right now, is a supercomputer sitting in a room in our York Heights laboratory. But it's been a curious social phenomenon. There has been great pressure from the media and others to talk about Watson as a person. Like, who is Watson? So I've kind of acceded to that. I'm going to talk about who is Watson. And the, the pressure has been fairly varied. Um, this past February, during HIMSS, um, HIT News named Watson one of the most innovative 10 people in healthcare in the previous year. <laughs> so far be it from us to oppose the media. Uh, e even in my own family, there is this tendency towards, towards uh, anthropomorphic uh, um, ideas about Watson. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I gave a talk in Canada about Watson at the Canadian eHealth conference. And the, the turnout was quite large. The, the more people showed up than can, could fit in the room. And so that evening I called my wife because it was very exciting to see all that attention. And I told her what happened. And my wife, and maybe because she's an attorney, has committed herself to keeping my ego grounded. So I told her about all these people. And she said, well, that's really great, Marty. But remember, they were there to meet Watson, not you. <laughs> so we, we now start talking about who is, is Watson. I'm assuming most of you know that Watson defeated the two reigning Jeopardy! champions back in February, and that rocketed it to, to fame. It became kind of a, a buzzword, a household word, uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, Watson. Um, it took IBM four years to teach Watson how to play Jeopardy. It started just about four or five years ago. Um, it, Watson is a tool that does natural language processing. It actually understands language. It just, just doesn't see the words. It actually understands language. And the reason that Jeopardy! was chosen as the arena in which to demonstrate Watson was because it's, it's, it's world, you know, world known in the entire English-speaking world. Everybody knows Jeopardy! And Jeopardy! uses intentionally arcane, obscure language for its stimuli. So as you know, in Jeopardy! It, it, they give you an answer in a certain category, and you have to formulate a question that is appropriate for that, that answer. And so Watson, over four years, developed the, the technology to be able to understand the nuance of that language and then go out into literature sources to find the appropriate response to the Jeopardy! stimulus. Um, its evolution over four years was fairly dramatic. The, the, the designers of IBM, led, led by Dave Ferrucci, originally thought that they were just basic, basically going to have a massive database that understand the kinds of, of stimuli that Jeopardy would, would use, have a massive database, kind of a look up and come back with appropriate responses. And it turned out that process failed miserably. They never got any better than like 20 or 30 percent appropriate responses. So they junked that whole approach and moved over to what they call massively parallel probabilistic algorithms. They're basically hundreds upwards of a thousand different algorithms that help it understand language and decide what is an appropriate response to the stimulus. So for example, they have algorithms that help Watson recognize a pun, and further algorithms that help Watson understand the pun, and further al algorithms that then help it look through literature to come back with an appropriate response given that it understands that, that, that pun. And that's where it started. So as Watson got better and better at playing Jeopardy, uh, the first time the producers of Jeopardy! saw Watson, they said, you know, it's not very good. This is not going to be an exciting program. Then shortly thereafter, Watson had a huge jump in its performance, and the producers came back and saw how Watson was doing in playing Jeopardy. And they decided then and there that was the time to have the TV program. Because their fear at that point was if they gave the Watson team much more time, Watson would be so dominant that it wouldn't be a competitive program. And they, didn't, and they didn't want to go any further. So right then when they thought it was competitive. So the team was quite anxious about this because it wasn't clear that Watson was going to win. And when it did, uh, they, they, they were quite pleased. So we play Jeopardy. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that the senior leadership of IBM quickly decided that playing Jeopardy was not a long-term business model. <laughs> it's kind of a, a one-time thing, except for the re repeated programs. Um, and so they moved on to, to something else. So looking for our arena of human endeavor, 
where Watson could make a difference. And sort of our philosophy in, in, in healthcare at IBM is technology is wonderful. You know, I, I am not a computer scientist, just for full disclosure. Uh, I am a technologist. I started off my career as an academic research biomedical engineer working in the areas of information theory and pattern recognition. I practiced emergency medicine for 30 years, was a healthcare executive, a healthcare po policy analyst. So although I am a technologist and not a computer scientist, I look at technology from the view of what does it do to advance the transformation of healthcare. And so that's our, our position. So when IBM leadership was looking for an arena in which Watson can make a difference, be an enabler of change, they settled on healthcare. And one of the reasons is what other area in which humans engage is like Jeopardy in that it uses intentionally uh, obscure arcane language to minimize understanding. Not a <laughs> So healthcare be, be, became became one of our one of our first choices. So Watson itself, the physical Watson, is a supercomputer. The original one lives in Yorktown Heights in, in its own room. It had almost three thousand parallel processors. Okay, it, 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 um, teraflops, eighty teraflops a second, with the um, the kind of programming and development that the team did. Um, it needed a supercomputer to process it. So Watson is able to read and understand 200 million pages of text in three seconds. Just think if you could read and understand that much. Okay. And that was a requirement for playing Jeopardy. Because as you know, in Jeopardy, you have three seconds within which to decide if you have the right response and to buzz in. In fact, it had to do it faster than that because it was going up against Ken Jennings who had been the reigning Jeopardy! champion and typically buzzed in in something slightly over a second. So it had to do better than that. And when they spoke to Ken Jennings about how he worked, is the reason he buzzed in so quickly is that he buzzed in, when he first saw the, saw the answer to which he had to create the question, he buzzed in if he thought by the time three seconds was up he would know the answer. He didn't wait until he knew the answer to buzz in. So when you watch his performance, he buzzed in first something like 80 to 90 percent of the time and was right roughly 80 percent of the time. So one of the reasons he was so dominant is he left the other two candidates, the other two contestants, to fight over one-fifth of the questions. He, he just took over the board. So Watson had to come back and do this very, very quickly. Now, in healthcare, we don't have the same constraint. In playing Jeopardy, you had to come back with a single response. But that's not the case in healthcare. Healthcare is inherently less deterministic. So that is not our focus, although in watching Jeopardy, you could believe that's how Watson worked. But if any of you actually saw the, the Jeopardy program, below the Watson avatar, they always had three possible responses that, that were displayed um, in, in a, a, an insight below, below Watson with a decimal number associated with it. That decimal number represented Watson's belief that that response was relevant to the stimulus. And in playing Jeopardy, if its confidence level in the first response exceeded a threshold that Watson calculated for that point in the game, um, it would buzz in. And if it did not, then it would not buzz in. And, and that threshold itself was calculated dynamically depending on the strategic position in the game. So if Watson were way ahead and losing money was not a big problem, because as you know in Jeopardy, you lose as much as you would have won if you were incorrect. Uh, Watson would set a relatively low threshold for itself. If it was a very tight game and losing money would drop Watson out of the lead position, then it set itself a very high threshold. But it, it, so it showed the top three responses that it came with, and there could have been hundreds of, of responses there um, that, that Watson was considering. So it, it, Jeopardy was a little skewed in that it, 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 Watson had to come up with a, a, a dichotomous, yay or nay, am I going to buzz in? Um, uh, sort of uh, response, which is not what we view in, in healthcare. And Watson, in plain Jeopardy, was also constrained to use stored data. So it had 15,000 gigabytes of storage. It could only use stored data. It could not go out into the web because that was deemed to be an unfair advantage. Um, and so it had to deal on, on stored data. So part of the training for Watson, and Watson was trained to play Jeopardy by feeding it thousands of previously used answer question pairs from the game. And so some of the things that Watson taught itself, besides being able to understand the language and determining what was the kind of response that was appropriate, is what sources of information are more likely to give it good responses. 
So besides coming up with confidence levels and its responses, Watson taught itself kind of a, a reliability index for different sources of information. And based on its understanding of what was being requested, it might go to different sources of information. So for example, Watson taught itself that if the, the uh, Jeopardy stimulus was about the film industry, that the IMDB database was a good place to go to. So this was all internal. Watson taught itself, it was a self-learning system, it knew what it didn't know, and it knew where to go for information. And if it was wrong, it learned that that, that was unreliable um, information. So we can imagine, just think about how this would carry over into healthcare, the same kind of a analytic uh, processes. So the question for us now is, is uh, what is Watson, I'm trying to talk to you about that, and uh, how are we putting it to work, and what can we expect in the future? So just by way of a um, little introduction, let me just pull up this um, video. Dr. Chase will now present to you a sort of a deeper dive into this healthcare arena. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. I realized yesterday on my way down, I got an email from the Office of the National Coordinator saying that the president had declared this week officially Health IT Week. I believe that's the case. I went to see the signed statement on the web this morning. And I can't think of a better time to roll this out. Uh, after all those years of waiting, and I've been in the business a long time where computers, we hoped the computers would help us, uh, we're finally here. So just share with you a case I had as an, a resident 35 years ago. Uh, the, the patient was uh, had worsening muscle weakness, was bedridden, uh, could no longer walk. She was in the hospital for several months. She was on the muscle service. They did muscle biopsies and nerve biopsies. They called me as the medical resident to do a consult. I'm still not sure why they called the kid to come up and do the diagnosis. It's partly um, that uh, maybe they didn't have any, they didn't know who else to call. Uh, and I remember distinctly she had two abnormal lab values uh, uh, and this symptom of myopathy. I really didn't know what was wrong with her. Uh, she came back to see me in the, in the weeks that followed. I eventually figured out that she had a very rare form of rickets called vitamin D resistant rickets. Uh, and uh, we figured that out, we treated her, and she got better. And I've carried this case around in my head for 35 years, always wondering if we could have gotten there faster. It was a, literally an elapsed time of three months by the time we figured out what was wrong with that. It's a long time, and it was a tremendous burden on the hospital, the cost to her, all the vibes, et cetera. So in the middle of the night, I woke up, I thought, God, what would Watson say to those three clues? So without telling the IBM team what I was doing, I'm a scientist, we can experiment. Uh, I gave them the three clues, which was myopathy, high or elevated alkaline phosphatase, or low phosphate, uh, and the first two were, of course, the two likely diseases, hyperparathyroidism and rickets was right there. Uh, uh, hyperparathyroidism is a completely plausible explanation, can be distinguished between rickets by a simple blood test. And what was mind-boggling to me, honestly, was down on the list was the mechanism by which she got the rickets, this very rare form of vitamin D resistant rickets, the hyperphosphaturia. And my point here is that if when they called me, the muscle service, they called the kid to come and give the, you know, do the consult. If I had this sheet of paper with me, I would have known exactly what was wrong with her. And I would have had to order only two tests, both of which are probably the cheapest ones in the hospital. And by the next morning, we would have had a diagnosis. And uh, we knew then what we know now in terms of those diseases. Uh, it just proved to me that Watson can find the information, not only the differential diagnosis, but also the mechanism. So that was uh, Herb Chase, who's professor of medicine at Columbia, one on our healthcare advisory board, not an IBM employee, uh, talking about his experience with Watson. And um, it sort of gives us an idea of what we can, can hope for uh, from Watson going forward. And Watson, uh, we can look at it as kind of an evolution in how we manage information. You know, you know IBM's theme for this couple of years is, is smarter planet, smarter city, smarter healthcare. And that involves being instrumented, inter interconnected, and intelligent, and using tools to allow us to make better decisions, to identify information that's relevant, process that information, make it actionable, and bring it to the, the people or organizations that are making, making decisions. 
And so, you know, we've had this history over years of, of what, how we use information to make decisions. Uh, my career in healthcare is, is, is long enough that um, did not have desktop computers when I started, didn't even have reasonable calculators, um, and everything was done with columnar paper and adding machines. Okay, and then we progressed. So we, we then we, we had um, the spreadsheets, and we could deal with numerical data, but it was dependent on what we thought we could do with it, what we understand that we could do with it, and what the sources of information were that, that we had. So I could do things like you know, um, look at variations in, in patient arrivals in the emergency department, nothing much more sophisticated than that. Then we move progressively along to predictive an analytics and, and simulations. Okay, if I change something in the operating room or in the emergency department, what might happen in terms of our efficiency or ability to manage patients? And now we're moving even further to understanding population analytics, and now with Watson getting into the ability to use the huge volumes of unstructured data. We are at risk of being overwhelmed by data. Okay, it's you know, doubling every year. Some people say it's going to be uh, 800, uh, increase 800 percent in the next five years, and most of that is, is unstructured data. And the data is all over the place. Okay, it, it's in journal articles, it's in textbooks, it's in your your institution's electronic health record, it's in the social media. And we know all these sources of information are important. The information in the social media. Um, is, is voluminous, and it, it turns out that for whatever sociologic reasons, many people are more comfortable sharing intimate personal healthcare information in these internet media than they are with their own doctors. And it's had an impact on research. I attended a meeting at the NIH about two years ago about the future of healthcare research, and they talked about the gold standard, you know, the traditional gold standard of research, which is the double blind randomized controlled study which is always a difficult thing to do when you're talking about healthcare and re recruiting the cadre of patients you know, for, for your controls and for your experimental group and you know, getting physicians and other clinicians to participate in it. It's, it's been a major, major challenge, v very expensive. But the new challenge, because of the social media, is when people are enrolled in the studies and they share information with other people you know, and patients like me or whatever, they've been able to deduce that they're probably in the control arm of the study and drop out. So it's an additional challenge. So that, that information is out there. And in the case of NIH's study plans, it was an impediment. But in terms of getting access to information, um, it, it could be uh, uh, of, of great value. So just for numbers about information, 90% of all the world's data was, came out in the last two years. Four-fifths of it is, is unstructured. And we need to use that. There's a lot of information there. It's not exclusive. The structured data is, is very important, too. But you know, our ability to use the unstructured data up until now has been quite limited. And so the way I'd like you to think about Watson is Watson is clinical decision support in a very special way. Okay, if you think about how it played Jeopardy, okay, it understood the question. It went into its stored resources, could read 200 million pages of text in three seconds and understand it, decide which information and in all that it read was relevant to the response that it had to create, and come back with a list of suggested responses that, you know, it, 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 by the Jeopardy rules, it had to pick the top one, but it come, came back with a list of suggested responses that were relevant to the decision to be made with varying levels of, of, of confidence. So in that unique circumstance where it had to make a decision, Watson did it, but that wasn't its fundamental mechanism. It comes back with a long, potentially long list of possible um, responses to consider with varying confidence levels, and if it were not in the Jeopardy framework, it would provide that to the person making the ultimate decision, as these are things for you to, to consider. This, these are things you want to think about in making your decision. Because when we make decisions in healthcare, uh, whatever level of clinician or administrator or, or research director, we would all like to have more information in our heads than we do. Okay. We want to have the, we want to think we're practicing in an evidence-based way and that we're using all the most recent information and we're not forgetting anything. But we know we can't do that. There's one study listed here showed that roughly four-fifths of the physi physicians have no more than five hours a week, a month to read. Just, it's not that they don't want to, they haven't got the time. Okay, and even if they read more, how much are they going to remember? So what Watson does is it, go, it understands the nature of the question that you have to address and goes out into 
the sea of literature, all the information you would like to have but don't have the time to read or the ability to memorize, and bring back to you, based on all this study, a list of suggestions for you to consider. So it doesn't make decisions. It says, I understand the question at hand. Say it's a diagnosis, that you have to make a diagnosis. And as in Herb Chase's example, um, uh, you know, this is all the information. I've done a lot of reading. I, in IBM, we're working with many publishers and other content providers to get Watson access in real time, um, uh, um, uh, access to all the most recent literature that it can process, read, and, and, and prioritize, and bring that back to you. So Watson is clinical decision support and giving you access to the information that you would like to have, that you would wish you would have read or remembered, uh, but can't. So it doesn't come back and make the decision for you. Now, what's the difference between Watson and something that just recognizes words? And wh what does it mean to actually understand language? So this was an actual question, an actual answer. Um, uh, the stimulus from, from, from uh, Jeopardy is, uh, where was Einstein born? Okay. Now, it would be possible to have kind of a structured data lookup where different physicists were born and Einstein is own. But if the, the question, the, the stimulus, as it actually was in Jeopardy, was one day from among his city views of Ohm, Otto chose a watercolor to send to Albert Einstein as a remembrance of Einstein's birthplace. To infer from that statement that Einstein is born in Ohm is not just a lookup. You actually have to understand that language to, to infer that. An even more complex question is, um, the, if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself a master painter during his tenure at GE. So in order to answer this one properly, uh, Watson had to understand that the term master painter in this sentence doesn't mean his oils are hanging in the metropolitan. It refers to a different set of skills. And so interpreting that, understanding that, and coming back with the proper response to this Jeopardy answer is a real challenge. It demonstrates how, how, how um, powerful Watson is as, a, as an ability to language, understand language. So let's talk a little bit how about Watson goes through this understanding process and how it carries over to, into healthcare. So in playing Jeopardy, uh, Watson would uh, per perceive the stimulus, the answer that Jeopardy provided. Okay. And in order to, so would understand it, use all its par parallel algorithms to understand um, what it meant. And then it would go out into a set of, of resources it called answer sources. It's the way Watson worked, it would create a very long list of possible responses. It could be hundreds or even thousands of possible responses based on reading all, all the, those pages of information. Then once it created that list, and that list come from a variety of places, so it found, for example, that Wikipedia was a good source of possible responses. Now, despite all the criticism of Wikipedia that it's unedited and not reliable, Watson found over time that going to Wikipedia was a good place to get a lot of answers, a lot, a lot of potential responses. Then Watson would go to other sources of information that it, it considered evidence sources, and it would read these evidence sources and use the information it got from its evidence sources to evaluate the appropriateness of each of the answers on its long list of answers. And so we'd use the evidence to say, now this answer is irrelevant. Uh, this is one I'm going to keep with a high confidence level. This is one I'm going to keep with a low confidence level. And winnow down that long list of answers to ones that were more likely to, uh, to be appropriate and assign confidence levels to each of those responses that, uh, and how Watson felt about, about it be, it's being appropriate. And then it would offer that up. So in plain jeopardy, if one of those answers exceeded the threshold, it would buzz in. But in the healthcare environment, that's how Watson would process healthcare information and offer suggestions to the decision maker to consider. Again, it's not going to say this is the answer. Uh, very often in healthcare, there's not a single answer. Okay, there may be multiple. But it would come back with a list of suggestions appropriate for the question at hand, and then the final decision maker would look that over and decide which one or ones on that list are ones that they want to continue to, to work with. So even another example of, of how Watson works in, in playing Jeopardy and how this is going to carry over. Okay, in one of the um, actual Jeopardy contests, the statement in May 1898, Portugal celebrated um, the 400th anniversary of this explorer's arrival in India. Somewhere else in the internet, okay, is maybe on a blog, is the statement that in May, Gary arrived in India after he celebrated his anniversary in Portugal. So if we look at that as a search engine would, which basically matching keywords, 
That's a five keyword match between those two statements. So if you were using a simple search engine and put in that statement or those keywords, high on the list of hits would be this statement about Gary. Now in a search engine, it's not gonna come back and say Gary, it'll link you to a page that has these keywords on it. But high up on that list, because it's a five keyword match, will be this statement about Gary. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that Gary is not the explorer that they're looking for here. So how would Watson go about doing this? Well, in its, as I mentioned, it uses hundreds of, of parallel uh, algorithms. So some of the style of algorithms are include temporal algorithms, statistical paraphrasing, and geospatial reasoning. So Watson would look at it and say, okay, in May, May 1898 and 400th anniversary could, link, could well be 27th of May 1498, which appears in another statement. An arrival in could be a paraphrase of landed in, and Coppet Beach is in India. So in addition to looking at keywords, would actually analyze the associations between this language, and it would then conclude from this, as it did in playing the game, that Vasco da Gama, with a high confidence level, not 100%, but a high confidence level, is a name to be considered. So it would come back with this, with think, of, think about Vasco da Gama, not a link to this page that described da Gama, but Vasco da Gama. And in this case, in playing Jeopardy, it was a high enough confidence level that it buzzed in and, and was correct. So how does that carry over into healthcare? Well, t temporal reasoning is, is easy. The temporal progression of disease or problems or response to therapy is a large part of what we use for, for making decisions. And geospatial reasoning could carry over quite directly to anatomic reasoning. Uh, the, the pain started in my fingertips and now it's uh, went up to my shoulder and now it's in my chest because we know that progression matters. Uh, statistical paraphrasing. An obvious example in healthcare is patients use terms differently than clinicians do. So if I'm in the emergency department and a patient comes in and says, I'm dizzy, you know, my first thought might be, okay, dizzy, that means a uh, room spinning around vertigo, official definition of dizzy. But patients don't know what those official definitions and they may use those terms very differently. So dizzy could mean I'm depressed, uh, I'm weak, um, you know, any of hundreds of possible meanings that this patient has for dizzy. So Watson understands this ambiguity in language. So if I were to feed into Watson amongst the information I have that patient is dizzy without clarifying it, you know, Watson would take that information, process it, understand it, go out and look at literature and come back with some suggestions. But Watson would also then say to me, because it is interactive, it would say, okay, my review of all this literature suggests that dizzy can mean many different things. So these are my suggestions right now, but if you tell me more about what this patient means by dizzy, then I'll do a better job and give you better suggestions. So please clarify that for me. You know, another example would be chest pain. Watson would understand that not only is it important to know that a patient has chest pain, but that the nature of the chest pain matters. Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it pleuritic? So this interactive process is an important part of Watson. You didn't see playing Jeopardy because Watson wasn't allowed to ask Alec Trebek for more information. But in healthcare, we don't have that, that, that constraint. So what Watson brings to us is it understands natural language and speech. It, it learns. So if it makes a mistake, it learns from its mistakes. And it learns how to change. So uh, using a Jeopardy example, there, there was one c category where the responses uh, had to include the name of a month. Okay. And w the first couple times Watson was incorrect because it did not include the name of a month. So um, the first thing they did is uh, Watson learned, okay, it's got to be the, the, the name of a month. And it, it first thought, okay, so it's one of the conventional you know, calendar months at, at January through December. And then the next question, the, the response was Ramadan. So it had to expand its horizons further. It the okay, there's the more than one name to give to a month. And it learned this over time. And so finally it, it got one of the responses in, in that category um, correct. So let's look a little bit at how Watson would approach um, a healthcare scenario. Right now we're teaching Watson how to play healthcare and we've been doing it in a progressive way. So we started off giving Watson um, uh, uh, multiple choice questions like doctor's dilemma and some of the materials that are used to train for certification exams which have you know, they're generally multiple choice questions or uh, at least explicitly there, there's a nominally a correct answer so Watson has been, uh, been working on those and we know if Watson was correct or close or, or off base. 
But that's only the first step. We're now moving to the point of Watson dealing with actual healthcare scenarios and, and records because healthcare is not multiple choice questions. And we've probably all had experience with colleagues who are great at multiple choice exams but useless in the clinical environment. So we're trying to teach Watson to be in the clinical environment. So the first thing Watson would do, and this is an actual case report from the New England Journal of Medicine, is look at uh, the, the categories of the words. So it would identify symptoms, diseases, medications, and modifiers. The modifiers are important because obviously no chest pain uh, is an important distinction from, from having chest pain. And then it would look at the associations between these words and what it learns from reading. So it might learn that, okay, the patient has fever, anorexia, and frequent urination. Um, my, my reading tells me this is consistent with urinary tract infection. So I'm going to suggest we consider urinary tract infection with a reasonably high level of confidence. But there's a lot of information in the list on the left that is not consistent with urinary tract infection. So we need to think about, about uh, something else. And about the, the, the interplay, okay, can the, the fever explain um, the thirst and dry mouth? Uh, what is the overlap here? So it looks at all, with all its analytic methodology, it looks at all these possible uh, interplays. And then it looks at the evidence that accumulates, the information that accumulates by category. So um, just as it looked at geospatial and, and temporal, uh, here it would look at symptoms and it would evaluate what, uh, what the symptoms mean and the association between symptoms and, and certain diseases. So based on the symptoms, it would conclude that these were uh, five possible diagnoses to consider with confidence levels based on the symptoms alone. And then it would include additional information, symptoms that were important for their absence, um, family history, patient history, medications the patient was taking, and findings, which would include laboratory tests and, um, and physical exam findings, and put those all together. And so it, it would take its confidence levels in each of the individual categories of evidence and then mathematically meld it, process it, and come up with this overall confidence level in, in, in these potential diagnoses, looking at it as from just making a decision about diagnosis. Same thing would be making therapeutic decisions or, or, or anything else similar to that. In this case, Watson would come up with urinary tract infection and diabetes with high confidence levels, which in fact were the diagnoses that this patient's physicians came up with in this case report. They said, aha, this patient has urinary tract infection and diabetes. They gave her treatment for that and, and sent her home. Um, but th they stopped too soon. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about mechanisms of, of error in, in healthcare and why Watson makes a difference. This patient's actually more critical diagnosis was metastatic breast cancer. The reason she was diabetic is one of the metastases was the pituitary, the part of the brain that controls hormonal regulation. And they did not appreciate her actual diagnosis until she had a fatal event sometime later. So what Watson would do in this case, at the very least, it would say, okay, I've got support for these two diagnoses, but there's a lot more going on here. Now, maybe I have some suggestions to consider, but at the very least, I'm going to tell you, we can't stop here. There's something else going on. So it would address this problem of stopping uh, too soon in the diagnostic process. So if we look at the diagnostic process, using that as an example, th this is a graphic of a, an author in the New England Journal of Medicine about the diagnostic process. And I'm focusing on diagnosis here, not because we're doing exclusively diagnosis, but as an example of where Watson's reasoning ability could help us. Okay, typically, you get you know, the patient's story. You collect a certain amount of information, either from the patient or from other sources. And then what this author called a, a, a problem representation. You start to form in your mind a, a vision of what's going on uh, with this patient. And then you start to generate hypotheses. You know, it's, these three diagnoses, and it's not going to be that diagnosis. You have your, your list. You start your differential diagnosis. Um, and then you look for more information to kind of help all fill this out. Uh, and eventually you come up with the diagnosis. And it's influenced by you know, the, the circumstances. This is the emergency department or the primary care office, what knowledge do you have, uh, what experience do you have, uh, what, what you know about the patient. But in each of these steps, there's the potential for error. So when um, decision, uh, errors in decision-making are studied, there are five or six different kinds of human behavior that are identified repetitively involved in decision error. And one of those behaviors is called the flaw of availability. Basically, you don't think of something you don't know about. So if it's available to you, you, know, you, you go forward. If it's not there or, or, or you have forgotten about it, then you're unlikely to bring it into your differential. 
And then that's compounded by a, a second recognized human behavior. And it's not just clinicians. It's all decision makers. Something called self-reinforcing perception bias. You have in mind what you've been thinking about. And you are now wedded to it. And you selectively go out and look for information that supports your original hypotheses and actively suppress information that's contrary. That would tell you maybe you made a mistake. Again, this applies to all human decision making. Probably explains why most politicians get reelected. <laughs> so where does Watson fit in? Well, I, you know, I've explained to you how Watson works, but it comes back with, with a list of suggestions that it's completely processed. And so if you are using Watson to make a decision, Watson brings that information to you as a list of suggestions to, to consider. So it fills in for things you might not have thought about, the flaw of availability, but it also is not biased. It looks at all the information objectively and processes it completely. It makes no premature decisions. So it looks at all the information, comes up with this list of answers, evaluates each of the answers, asks you for more information if it needs it. So it doesn't let you focus on your initial set of hypotheses because it keeps all the relevant suggestions in front of you. So it's two examples of how Watson can help improve healthcare decision making. Now, another role that Watson has is fill, fills in some of the gaps in functionality that we have with electronic health records. Okay. When electronic health records first started to be implemented maybe 30 years ago, we had this vision that it was the panacea. It was going to solve all our information problems in healthcare. Nothing would be forgotten. Nothing would be lost. It would all be immediately accessible to us. Um, it, it hasn't turned out that way for a variety of reasons. Some of the, the clumsiness of the interfaces, um, the inability to process the information in a useful, practical way, a whole variety of things. So this, these are um, uh, extracts from an article, um, from articles by Gordon Schiff and David Bates from Harvard, who are kind of health information theorists, who work with electronic health records, you know, identifying you know, what's good about them, what, what are the limitations. So you know, as we mentioned earlier, we're sort of being overwhelmed by information, and that can be in the electronic health record too. So you know, as an example, when, when I was in practicing emergency medicine. Um, imagine Saturday night, Sunday morning, 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, get a, a patient from a nursing home, an 85-year-old person who's unable to communicate for whatever reason, and you get a half page of typewriter paper with a handwritten note, patient sick. All the information you get, and you call the nursing home, and they say, well, the nurse who sent that one just went off shift, and I don't know anything about the patient. So you're stuck, and you go to the old chart. So invariably, it's one of two things. Either there is no old chart because the patient's never been in your hospital before, or there is an old chart and the patient's been cared for in your institution for 45 years and the chart is 37 inches of paper. Okay. So you know all the information is in there, but there's no way you can assimilate it, find all the important things, the relevant things to the decision you have to make in the time frame in which you have to make a decision. Well, that same thing carries over to electronic records. If you have an extensive electronic record and a lot of it is, is unstructured, is how do you look at the priorities? If I'm dealing with this 85-year-old person, you know, um, I, I don't want to read about the wrist fracture that occurred when the patient was 11. But electronic health records can't prioritize. Watson can do that. If Watson has permission to look at the patient's electronic health record and, and with the information that's given, understands the nature of the question to be addressed, Watson can bring out the prioritized information from the record and say, these are the things you ought to think about. So it, it can help prioritize the information th that we do have. Okay. Um, electronic health records don't suggest diagnoses. They don't tell you what's in, what information is missing that ought to be in the record that isn't. Watson will do both of those. Okay. And what, uh, most electronic health records do not support collaboration amongst different levels of different kinds of practitioners, the pulmonologist, the cardiologist, the, the neurologist, all dealing with the same chart, but with an inability to share and prioritize information. Uh, Watson uh, can, can help with that. And um, when you're using electronic health record, if you're thinking about diagnoses, they don't help you get the information that you might need to support your, your, your deliberations. When Watson makes suggestions to you, about diagnoses. It also provides you a link through that suggestion to the evidence that Watson used to create that suggestion. So if it comes back with a suggestion, you say, gee, I did not know Sjogren's syndrome could account for this. You link back through Sjogren's syndrome and Watson will take you to the literature that supported its suggestion. So it gives you more access to information. 
So um, I think I'm, I'm, hope I'm, I'm making the point that Watson, in its essence, gives you access to information, information that you want to have to help you make better decisions. It's not a decision maker for you. It gives you access to information. So we have spent the last year and a half meeting with many um, healthcare organizations of, of, all, of all categories, uh, patient groups, provider groups, payer groups, uh, pharmaceutical industry, um, uh, publishers, about where Watson can help. And it's across the board. You know, it, so I'm, I'm saying physicians a lot, but I mean any clinician or in truth any decision maker in healthcare, uh, we think Watson can help. So the, the, the spine, the backbone of all this starts with the patient inquiry through the workup and differential diagnosis and treatment decisions and following ongoing treatment. But it then explodes into other related kinds of uh, phenomenon, like uh, um, when, does, um, when do you need to see a specialist? Okay, there's a study that came out from uh, um, the government just a month or so ago that primary care providers are now twice as likely to refer a patient to a specialist as they were 10 years ago. And some of the major reasons for that is they're just so busy churning through patients that they haven't got time to apply the knowledge that they do have to manage the patient. It's easier for them to refer it. Um, and in part, if, if Watson can help them make better decisions, may be able to cut down on these avoidable, unnecessary referrals. Because one of the future goals of healthcare is to emphasize primary care. Okay. Because we know from many studies that when primary care is robust and patients have a primary care team in which they have confidence, then quality goes up and costs go down. So anything we can do to empower primary care providers um, is a goal. And so uh, helping with that kind of decision making. And uh, on the far left we have consumer portal. Another one of the goals for the future of healthcare is the empowered knowledgeable patient. We have lots of challenges in healthcare. Patients don't follow their, their care plans. They don't take their medication. Uh, they don't do their follow-up visits, all, all sorts of challenges. So it's recognized that if we can help patients become more knowledgeable, understand what has to be done to keep them healthy or to improve their care, they will be more active participants, more likely to follow their care plan, and able to be active participants in the decision-making process. So imagine an integrated network okay, with... Uh, that has total care responsibility for, for the patient. And they offer to the patient this consumer portal, an Ask Watson kind of, kind of service, where the patient can enter a question in the patient's own language. It doesn't have to be keywords. The patient can describe it however they would normally describe it, and Watson will understand it. And if in this integrated network Watson has access to the patient's electronic health record, Watson will read the electronic health record, learn more about the patient, and come back with prioritize personalized suggestions for this patient, for so understanding about the patient. And in this integrated network, that information would be shared with the patient's primary care team, say a care coordinator. So not only does the patient have access to evidence-based personalized information, unlike a random search of the web, but somebody to talk to about it, somebody to actively participate with in making decisions. So in terms of the goal of, since we're all in the future going to have to make more decisions you know, with our teams, we're getting away from the paternalistic of you do this because I told you is a potential role for, for Watson also. So talk about some of the things we're actively doing in, in healthcare uh, right now. We uh, last month announced the partnership with Memorial Sloan Kettering to help create tools to improve decision making um, in, in oncology. And why oncology? Well, we, we're starting off with specialties um, because you know, Watson still has to prove its cre credibility in the, in the real world. And you know, so uh, oncology is already kind of a filtered set of, uh, of patients because by the time patients get referred to an oncologist, you know, it's already, uh, already a, a reduced set. And the, you know, it's not all the, the, the world's healthcare information, it's just oncology. And we have the ability to partner with organizations that are world-renowned for their own research and, and level of care, such as Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it also will give us access to one and a half million patient records to help teach Watson about how to, how to evaluate patients. And you know, cancer is one of the major chronic diseases um, that is uh, great morbidity, mortality, and great cost. And the cost of managing cancer is actually um, accelerating faster than the overall increase in, in health care. So there are lots of reasons uh, why, why this, this was a good choice. So right now, we're in the process of teaching Watson oncology. And you know, in the process, we think we may learn things and be able to change things around. 
um, like traditionally, and if there are any oncologists in here, if, if I'm incorrect, please correct me. Uh, traditionally, oncologists view their preferences for therapeutic interventions based on the median survival that is associated in population studies with that, with that particular therapeutic intervention. A study this, published this month in Health Affairs indicates that patients think about it differently, that that's not their primary, may not be their primary consideration. What this study did is it, looked, it gave patients a choice between uh, a therapeutic option that had the highest median survival and another option that had a lower median survival but a likelihood of a much greater survival, like 10% likelihood they would survive much longer than the median survival. And three-quarters of patients chose the option for a lower median survival but a chance of a much longer survival. So bringing patient preferences into the decision-making process and being able to scour all the possible options is something where we think Watson will come into this. So right now we're teaching Watson uh, about um, how to make decisions in oncology using things like standardized guidelines, but the future potential is actually looking much more broadly than that in the goal of personalizing healthcare. Uh, we're also working with, with WellPoint, and our first project with WellPoint is um, the prior authorization process, a very complex, time-consuming process where clinicians submit a request for authorization that a certain intervention, either diagnostic or therapeutic, uh, will be reimbursed. Now, it may seem like a, a, a trivial task, uh, but it actually is very important for, for several reasons. One, it's very, very costly. Um, another article in Health Affairs last year um, concluded that for the average physician in the United States, the cost of interacting with payers is $85,000 a year. 16% of practice revenue goes through interacting with the payers. That sterile, useless money, it does nothing for the patient. It just feeds the bureaucracy. And the payers on the other side also have a very expensive bureaucracy to deal with, with, all, these, with all these requests. And so the, the typical process um, is okay, you have a diagnosis of cancer and making a decision about a therapeutic regimen. And you have to submit that to the insurance company for approval. Okay, and you know, so the, the physician sends it, maybe email, maybe paper. It gets reviewed by uh, a, a group of nurses um, at the insurance company, and either they can approve it or they can refer it to a panel of physicians, or they may say the information is incomplete and send it back. It goes back and forth. It can take months. It's a very expensive process. And meanwhile, the patient is sitting at home saying, I've, you know, I want to start my treatment. I don't want to sit here worrying about it. Okay. So if we come up with a system, as we are doing with WellPoint and Watson, that makes that process more efficient, more reliable, more likely to have the decision made by evidence, then everybody wins. Okay, the providers win because it, it simplifies their process and reduces their costs. The payers win because it simplifies their process and reduces costs. And the patient wins because it's more likely to be done more quickly. So the patient is sitting at home anxious and worried will get, get the answers that they need more quickly. So this really is a win-win-win and a demonstration of the value of collaboration. Our patient, provider, payer working together for the same goal of identifying what is best for the patient, more likely to have the good outcome, and control costs. Because that is our goal for the future. It's not just reducing costs like we had with the HMO models of the 70s, but reducing costs and improving outcome, which means collaboration. Everybody has to work together, use evidence and use information uh, to, to, to get there. So to wrap up the discussion of, of, of Watson, what does Watson do? Okay. Dave Ferrucci, who led the team that created Watson, says that Watson is a shallow reasoner. By shallow meaning, Watson looks at huge amounts of information and extracts from that information suggestions that are relevant to the decision to, that has to be made. It's not a deep reasoner in the sense that it doesn't say this is the answer. It says these are the ones that you ought to consider. And it can cast a wide net. Okay, and it's basically unlimited. When you can read 200 million pages of text in three seconds, you don't have to worry about the volume of literature that, that, that you're going to consume. You, you can handle it, it, it all. So it considers a large amount of data, including the EMR and literature. It is not biased. So it doesn't have the, um, the bias that, that, that humans have. Um, and it learns over time. So it'll know what sources are more relevant for a particular situation. It's not limited by the database structure. When you have a database structure, it doesn't work in playing Jeopardy. And it also means if you don't phrase your, your request in the right format, 
uh, you're going to get useless information back. And Watson makes no premature judgments, unlike humans. It looks at all the possibilities. And when Watson is interactive, as I mentioned, like it's a, tell me more about dizziness. Okay. When Watson gets the information, it starts all over again. Watson, from a computer point of view, is what's called stateless. Once it has processed the information, it does not remember what it just did. The way it learns is by adjustments in how it, it weighs and uses its algorithms. So if it made a mistake, you know, between its designers and Watson itself, it adjusts how the algorithms work. And that's the only memory it has. It doesn't recall any of the information. So if I asked the, you know, Watson a question about this patient with dizziness, and Watson came back to me and said, tell me more about dizziness, I would add the information about dizziness to the information. We'd send it back, the whole thing back to Watson again. And then Watson starts all over because it may come up with different answers with the no information. It doesn't want to constrain itself to the original set of answers. So it considers everything. It's not biased. It's not limited. It looks at everything fr from scratch. And that the additional value that has, is since Watson doesn't remember anything, it's unlikely to be a source of leak of protected health information because it doesn't retain it. Okay. So it hits a sweet spot for us. We know humans are very good at taking a, a, a limited list of possibilities and deciding which one or ones amongst that list are relevant or the ones we want to pursue far less able to process huge amounts of information to get back to that, that small list. So Watson fills in that gap for us and helps us uh, with our reasoning. We can't, we can't um, handle the, the, the huge volumes of, of information. Watson tells you what's missing. I need more information. And it may be, tell me more about this patient's symptom, or it may say, here are some suggestions. The literature tells me that this test, XYZ test, is something you want to think about because it will give me the most information to distinguish amongst these suggestions. And if you give me the results of that test, you know, I can do a better job on my suggestions for you. And it's interactive. It goes back and forth, I interactive between the decision maker and Watson to help both zero in on, on a desired evidence-based decision. So in terms of the goals of the, f the future of healthcare, um, we think Watson is an enabler. Watson is not a solution in that sense. Watson is not going to induce the transformation of healthcare. People are the transformative agents. If organizations and people are committed to the future vision of healthcare, which is um, evidence-based decision-making, um, outcomes-based rewards, patient-centeredness, and collaboration, then Watson, with its ability to process information and support decision-making, is an enabler of that transformation. But it counts on the organizations having made that commitment. It won't induce it. If you're there, then, then Watson uh, can help you. And we're looking at other areas too. Wherever large amounts of text-like information are relevant, a government um, the, the, uh, make, making decisions of financial services as well as healthcare are all areas that, that we're developing for Watson. So I hope I've been able to get you to understand what Watson does, how it fits into healthcare, and why we're so optimistic about its future. Thank you.